60 Great Ghost Stories, read by H. Washington Sawyer. Tonight's story, The Fairies, by Ramsey Campbell. When Barry reached Parkgate Promenade, he heard the waves. He couldn't recall having heard them during his stroll down the winding road from Neston Village, between banks whispering with grass past the guarded lights of infrequently curtained windows, beneath clouds diluted by moonlight. The movement of the waves looked indefinably strange. They sounded faint, not quite like water. The promenade was scarcely two cars wide. Thin lanterns stood on concrete stalks above the sea wall, which was overlooked by an assortment of early Victorian buildings, antique shops, cafes in the afternoons must be full of ladies t taking tea and cakes, a nursing home, a private school that looked as though it had been built as something else. In the faltering moonlight, all of them looked black and white. Some were Tudor-striped. As he strolled, the June night was mild. He might as well enjoy himself as best he could now that he was here. He passed the Marie Celeste Hotel. That must have appealed to his uncle. He was still grinning wryly when he reached his uncle's address. Just then, the moon emerged from the clouds. He saw what was wrong with the waves. There was no water beyond the seawall. Only an expanse of swaying grass that reached as far as he could see. The sight of the grass, overlooked by the promenade buildings as though it were still the River Dee, made him feel vaguely but intensely expectant, as though about to glimpse something on the pale, parched waves. Perhaps his uncle felt this too, for he was sitting at the black bow window on the first floor of the White House, gazing out beyond the sea wall. His eyes looked colorless in the moonlight. It took three rings of the bell to move him. Barry couldn't feel resentful. After all, he was probably his uncle's only living relative. Nevertheless, there were decisions to be made in London, at the publishers, books to be bought or rejected. Several were likely to be auctioned. He'd come a long way hurriedly, by several trains. His uncle's call had sounded urgent enough for that, as urgent as the pips that had cut him off. Barry only wished he knew why he was here. When at last his uncle opened the door, he looked unexpectedly old. Perhaps living ashore had aged him. He had always been small, but now he looked dwindled, though still tanned and leathery. In his spotless black blazer, with its shining silvery buttons and his tiny gleaming shoes, he resembled a doll of himself. Here we are again. Though he sounded gruff, his handshake was firm and felt grateful for company. Then he toiled upstairs, using the banisters as a series of walking sticks. He growled, Sit you down. There were no sense of the sea in the flat, not even maritime prints to enliven the timidly patterned wallpaper. Apart from a couple of large old trunks, the flat seemed to have nothing to do with his uncle. It felt like a waiting room. Get that down, you, James. His uncle's hardiness seemed faded. Even the rum was a brand that you could buy in supermarkets, not one of the prizes he used to bring back from his voyages. He sat gazing beyond the promenade, sipping the rum as though it were as good as any other. How are you, uncle? It's good to see you. They hadn't seen each other. For ten years, Barry felt inhibited. Besides, his uncle detested effusiveness. When he'd finished his rum, he said, You sounded urgent on the phone. Aye. The years had made him even more taciturn. He seemed to resent being reminded of his call. I wouldn't have expected you to live so far from everything, Barry said, trying a different approach. It went away. Apparently he was talking about the sea, for he continued, There used to be thirteen hotels at a pier, 
all the best people came here to bathe. They say the straits were as elegant as Bath. The private school, you passed. That was the old assembly rooms. Though he was gazing across the seawall, he didn't sound nostalgic. He sat absolutely still, as though relishing the stability of the room. He used to pace restlessly when talking, impatient to return to the sea. Then the dee set it up, he was saying. It doesn't reach here now, except in spring tides and storms. That's when the rats and the voles freeze in a promenade. What is it when they say? I haven't seen it, and I don't mean to. You're thinking of moving? Aye. Frowning at his clenched fists, he muttered, Will you take me back to here tomorrow and let me stay w- until I find somewhere? I have my boxes sent on. He mustn't want to make the journey alone in case he was taken ill. Still, Barry couldn't help sounding a little impatient. I don't live near the sea, you know. On that, reluctantly he added, I wish I lived further away. Perhaps now that he'd had to leave the sea, his first love, he wanted to forget about it quickly. Barry couldn't tell if he'd been embarrassed to ask for help, a captain needing help from a nephew who was seasick on a hovercraft. But he was a little old man now. His tan was only a patina. All at once, Barry saw how frail he was. All right, uncle, he said gently. It won't be any trouble. His uncle was nodding, not looking at him, but Barry could see he was moved. Perhaps now was the time to broach the idea Barry had had on the train. On my way here, he said carefully, I was remembering some of the tales you used to tell. You remember them, do you? The old man didn't seem to sound as though he wanted to. He drained a mouthful of rum in order to refill his glass had the salt smell that was wafting across the grass reminded him too vividly. Barry had meant to suggest the idea of a book of his uncle's yarns, for quite a few had haunted him. The pygmies who could carry ten times their own weight, the flocks of birds that buried in guano any ships that ventured into their territory, the light whose source was neither sun nor moon, but that outlined an island on the horizon which receded if ships made for it. Would it be a children's book, or a book that tried to trace the sources? Perhaps this wasn't the time to discuss it, for the smell that was drifting through the window was stagnant, very old. There was one story I never told you. Barry's head jerked up. He had been nodding off. Even his uncle had never begun stories so abruptly, as reluctantly. As this. Some of the men used to say it didn't matter if you saw it so long as you protected yourself. Was the old man talking to himself to take his mind off the desiccated river, the stagnant smell? One night we all saw it. One minute the sea was empty, the next the thing was there, close enough to swim to. Some of the men would almost have done that to get it over with. He gulped a mouthful of rum and stared sharply out across the pale, dry waves. Only they could see the faces watching. None of us forgot that. Ever. As soon as we got ashore, all of us bought ourselves protection. Even I did, he said bitterly. When I used to say... Civilized men kept pictures on walls. Having struggled out of his blazer, which was unbuttoned carefully and tediously, he displayed his left forearm. Blinking sleepily, Barry made out a tattoo, a graceful sailing ship surrounded by a burst of light. Its masts resembled almost recognizable symbols. The younger fellows thought that was all was needed We all wanted to believe it would keep us safe. I wonder how they feel now they're older. The old man turned quickly toward the window. He seemed angry 
that he'd been distracted. Something had changed his attitudes drastically, for he had hated tattoos. It occurred to Barry too late to prevent him from dozing that his uncle called him because he was afraid to be alone. Barry's sleep was dark and profound. Half-submerged images floated by, so changed as to be unrecognizable. Sounds reached him, rather as noise from the surface might try to reach the depths of the sea. It was impossible to tell how many times his uncle cried out before the calls woke him. James! The voice was receding, but at first Barry failed to notice this. He was too aware of the smell that filled the room. Something that smelled drowned in stagnant water was near him, so near that he could hear its creaking. At once he was awake, so afraid that he thought he was about to be sick. James! Both the creaking and the voice were fading. Eventually, he managed to persuade himself that despite the stench, he was alone in the room. Forcing his eyes open, he stumbled to the window. Though it was hard to focus his eyes and see what was out there, his heart was already jolting. The promenade was deserted. The buildings gleamed like bone. Above the sea wall, the lanterns glowed thinly. The wide, dry river was flooded with grass, which swayed in the moonlight, rustling and glinting. Over the silted river, leaving a wake of grass that looked whiter than the rest, a ship was receding. It seemed to be the color and texture of the moon. Its sails looked stained patchily by mold. It was full of holes, all of which were misshapen by glistening vegetation. Were its decks crowded with figures? If so, he was grateful he couldn't see their faces, for their movements made him think of drowned things lolling underwater, dragged back and forth by currents. Sweat streamed into his eyes. When he'd blinked them clear, the moon was darkening. Now the ship looked more like a mound from which a few trees sprouted, and perhaps the crowd was only swaying bushes. Clouds closed over the moon, but he thought he could see a pale mass sailing away, overtopped by lurid sketches that might be masts. Was that his uncle's voice, its desperation overwhelmed by despair? When moonlight flooded the landscape a few moments later, there was nothing but waves of grass from which a whiter swath was fading. He came to himself when he began shivering. An unseasonable chill wind was clearing away the stench of stagnant water. He gazed in dismay at his uncle's blazer draped neatly over the empty chair. There wasn't much that he could tell the police. He had been visiting his uncle, whom he hadn't seen for years. They had both had a good deal to drink, and his uncle, who had seemed prematurely aged, had begun talking incoherently and incomprehensibly. He'd woken to find his uncle had wandered away, leaving his blazer, though it had been a cold night. Did they believe him? They were slow and thorough, these policemen. Their thoughts were as invisible as he meant his to be. Surely his guilt must be apparent, the shame of hiding the truth about his uncle, of virtually blackening his character. In one sense, though, it seemed hardly to matter. He was sure they wouldn't find his uncle alive. Eventually, since Barry could prove that he was needed in London, they let him go. He trudged along the sweltering promenade. Children were scrambling up and down the seawall. Old people on sticks were being promenaded by relatives. In the hazy sunshine, most of the buildings were still black and white. Everywhere signs said, Fresh shrimps in a shop that afforded gifts and bygones. Ships were stiff in bottles. Waves of yellowing grass advanced, but never very far. He ought to leave, and be grateful that he lived inland. If what he'd seen last night had been real, the threat was far larger than he was. There was nothing he could do.
But suppose he had only heard his uncle's voice on the silted river and had hallucinated the rest. He'd been overtired and confused by his uncle's ramblings. How soon had he wakened fully? He wanted to believe that the old man had wandered out beyond the promenade and had collapsed, or even that he was alive out there, still wandering. There was only one way to find out. He would be in sight of the crowded promenade. Holding his briefcase above his head as though he was submerging, he clambered down the seawall. The grass was tougher than it looked. Large patches had to be struggled through. After five hundred yards he was sweating, yet he seemed to be no closer to the far bank, nor to anything else. Ahead, through the haze, he could just distinguish the colors of fields in their frames of trees and hedges. Factory chimneys resembled gray pencils. All this appeared to be receding. He struggled onward. Grass snagged him. Birds flew up on shrill wings, complaining. He could see no evidence of the wake he'd seen last night. Nothing but interminable grass. The screeching birds. The haze. Behind him, the thick heat had blurred the promenade. The crowds were pale shadows. Their sounds had been swallowed by the hissing of the grass. He'd been tempted several times to turn back, and was on the point of doing so when he saw a gleam in the dense grass ahead. It was near the place where he last glimpsed the ship, if he had done so. The gleaming object looked like a small shoe. He had to persuade himself to go forward, and remembered the swaying figures on the decks whose faces he dreaded to see. Nevertheless, he advanced furiously, tearing a path through the grass with his briefcase. He was almost there before he saw that the object wasn't a shoe, it was a bottle. When inertia carried him forward, he realized that the bottle wasn't empty. For an unpleasant moment, he thought it contained the skeleton of a small animal. Peering through the grime that coated the glass, he made out a whitish model ship with tattered sails. Tiny overgrown holes gaped in it. Though its decks were empty, he had seen it before. He stood up too quickly and almost fell. The heat seemed to flood his skull. The ground underfoot felt unstable. A buzzing of insects attacked him. There was a hint of stagnant smell. He was ready to run, dizzy as he was, to prevent himself from thinking. Then he remembered his uncle's despairing cry. James! James! Even then, if he had been able to run, he might have done nothing. But his dizziness both hindered him and gave him time to feel ashamed. If there was a chance of helping his uncle, however, impossible it seemed, he snatched up the bottle and threw it into his briefcase. Then, trying to forget about it, he stumbled back toward the crowds. His uncle was calling him. He woke to the sound of a shriek. Faces were sailing past him, close enough to touch if he could have reached through the glass. It was only a train on the opposite line, rushing by from London. Nevertheless, he couldn't sleep after that. He finished reading the typescript he brought with him, though he knew by now he didn't want to buy the book. The state of his desk was worse than he'd feared. His secretary had delivered most of his letters, but several books had piled up, demanding to be read. He was stuffing two of them into his briefcase to be read on the bus, and if he wasn't too tired at home, when he found he was holding the grimy bottle, at once he locked it in a drawer. Though he wasn't prepared to throw it away until he understood its purpose, he was equally reluctant to take it home. That night, he could neither sleep nor read. He tried strolling in Holland Park, but while that tired him further, it failed to calm him. The moonlit clouds that were streaming headlong across the sky made everything beneath them look unstable. Though he knew that the lit houses beyond the swaying trees were absolutely still, he kept feeling that the houses were rocking slyly at anchor. He lay trying to relax. Beyond the windows of his flat, Kensington High Street seemed louder than ever. 
nervous speculations kept him awake. He felt he'd been meant to find the bottle, but for what purpose? Surely it couldn't harm him. After all, he had only once been to sea. How could he help his uncle? His idea of a book of stories was nagging him. Perhaps he could write it himself as a kind of monument to his uncle, except that the stories seemed to be drifting away into the dark, beyond his reach, just like the old man. When eventually he dozed, he thought he heard the old man calling. In the morning, his desk looked even worse. The pile of books had almost doubled. He managed to sort out a few that could be trusted to readers for reports. Of course, a drain must have overflowed outside the publishers. That was why only a patch of pavement had been wet this morning. He knew it hadn't rained. He consulted his diary for distractions. Sales conference, 11 a.m. He succeeded in being coherent and even in suggesting ideas, but his thoughts were elsewhere. The sky resembled sluggish smoke, as though the oppressive day was smoldering. His mind felt packed with gray stuffing. The sound of cars outside seemed unnaturally rhythmic, almost like waves. Back at his desk, he sat trying to think. Lack of sleep had isolated him in a no-man's land of consciousness, close to hallucination. He felt cut off from whatever he was supposed to be doing. Though his hand kept reaching out impulsively, he left the drawer locked. There was no point in brooding over the model ship until he decided what to do. Beyond the window, his uncle cried out, no, someone was shouting to Guy Delari. It wasn't the word James at all. But he still didn't know how to help his uncle, assuming that he could, assuming that it wasn't too late. Would removing the ship from the bottle achieve something, in any case? Could one remove the ship at all? Perhaps he could consult an expert in such matters. I know exactly whom you want his secretary said, and arranged for them to meet tomorrow. Dave Peebles' lunch, 12.30. Ordinarily, he would have enjoyed the game, especially since Peebles liked to discuss books in pubs, where he tended to drink himself into an agreeable state. Today's prize was attractive, a best-selling series that Peebles wanted to take to a new publisher. But today he found Peebles irritating. Not only his satyr's expressions and postures, which were belied by his paunch, but also the faint smirk with which he constantly approved of himself. Still, if Berry managed to acquire the books, the strain would have been worthwhile. They ate in the pub just around a corner from the publishers. Before long, Berry grew frustrated. He was too enervated by lack of sleep to risk drinking much, nor could he eat much, for the food tasted unpleasantly salty. Peebles seemed to notice nothing, and ate most of Berry's helping before he leaned back, patting his paunch. Hell now, he said, when Berry raised the subject of books. What about another drink? Barry was glad to stand up, to feel the floor stable underfoot, for the drinkers at the edge of his vision had seemed to be swaying extravagantly. I'm not happy with the way my mob are promoting my books, Peebles admitted. They seem to be letting them just lie there. Barry's response might have been more forceful if he hadn't been distracted by the chair that someone was rocking back and forth with a steady rhythmic creaking. When Barry was finished making offers, people said, That doesn't sound bad. Still, I ought to tell you that several other people are interested. Barry wondered angrily whether he was simply touring publishers in search of free meals. The pub felt damp. The dimness appeared to be glistening. No doubt, it was very humid. Though the street was crowded, he was glad to emerge. I'll be in touch, Peebles promised grudgingly, but at the moment Barry didn't care. For on the opposite pavement, 
The old man's voice was crying, James! It was only a newspaper seller naming his wares, which didn't sound much like James. Surely a drain must have overflowed where the wet patch had been. There was a stagnant smell. Editor's meeting, 3 o'clock p.m. He scarcely had time to gulp a mug of coffee beforehand, almost scalding his throat. Why did they have to schedule two meetings in one day? When there were silences in which people expected him to speak, he managed to say things that sounded positive and convincing. Nevertheless, he heard little except for waves of traffic advancing and withdrawing, and the desperate cries in the street. What was that crossing the intersection? A long, pale shape bearing objects like poles. It had gone before he could jerk his head around, and his colleagues were staring only at him. It didn't matter. If any of these glimpses weren't hallucinations, surely they couldn't harm him. Otherwise, why hadn't he been harmed that night in Parkgate? It was rather a question of what he could do to the glimpses. Yes, that's right, he said to the silence. Of course it is. Once he'd slept, he would be better able to cope with everything. Tomorrow he would consult an expert. After the meeting, he slumped at his desk, trying to find the energy to gather books together and head for home. His secretary woke him. Okay, he mumbled. You go on. He'd follow her in a moment. When he was more awake, it occurred to him that if he hadn't dozed off in Parkgate, his uncle might have been safe. That was another reason to try to do something. He'd get up in a few moments. It wasn't dark yet. When he woke again, it was. He had to struggle to raise his head. His elbows had shoved piles of books to the edge of the desk. Outside, the street was quiet except for the whisper of an occasional car. Sodium lamps craned their necks toward his window. Beyond the frosted glass of his office cubicle, the maze of the open floor plan office looked even more crowded with darkness than the space around his desk. When he switched on his desk lamp, it showed him a blurred reflection of himself trapped in a small pool of brightness. Hurriedly, he switched on the cubicle's main light. Though he was by no means awake, he didn't intend to wait. He wanted to be out of the building, away from the locked drawer. Insomnia had left him feeling vulnerable, on edge. He swept a handful of books into his briefcase. God, they were becoming a bad joke, and emerged from his cubicle. He felt uncomfortably isolated. The long, angular room was lifeless. None of the desks seemed to retain any sense of the person who sat there. The desertion must be swallowing his sounds, which seemed not only dwarfed, but robbed of resonance as though surrounded by an emptiness that was very large. His perceptions must be playing tricks. Underfoot, the floor felt less stable than it ought to. At the edge of his vision, the shadows of desks and cabinets appeared to be swaying, and he couldn't convince himself that the lights were still. He mustn't let any of this distract him. Time enough to think when he was home. It took him far too long to cross the office, for he kept teetering against desks. Perhaps he should have taken time to waken fully, after all. When eventually he reached the lifts, he couldn't bring himself to use one. At least the stairs were open, though they were very dark. He groped, swaying, for the light switch. Before he'd found it, he recoiled. The wall he had touched felt as though it was streaming with water. A stagnant stench welled up out of the dark. When he grabbed the banister for support, that felt wet, too. He mustn't panic. A door or window was open somewhere in the building. That was all he could hear creaking. Its draft was making things feel cold, not wet and was swinging the lights back and forth. Yes, he could feel the draft blustering at him and smell what must be a drain.
He forced himself to step onto the stairs. Even the darkness was preferable to groping for the light switch, when he no longer knew what he might touch. Nevertheless, by the time he reached the half landing, he was wishing for light. His vertigo seemed to have worsened, for he was reeling from side to side on the staircase. Was the creaking closer? He mustn't pause. Plenty of time to feel ill once he was outside, in a taxi. He ought to be able to hold off panic so long as he didn't glimpse the ship again. He halted so abruptly that he almost fell. Without warning, he'd remembered his uncle's monologue. Barry had been as dopey then as he was now, but one point was all at once terribly clear. Your first glimpse of the ship meant only that you would see it again. The second time, it came for you. He hadn't yet seen it again. Surely he still had a chance. There were two exits from the building. The creaking and the growing stench would tell him which exit to avoid. He was stumbling downstairs because that was the alternative to falling. His mind was a gray void that hardly even registered the wetness of the banisters. The foyer was in sight now at the foot of the stairs, its linoleum gleaming. Less than a flight of stairs now, less than a minute stumbling. But it was not linoleum. The floorboards were bare, where there ought not even to be boards, only concrete. Shadows swayed on him, cast by objects that, though out of sight for the moment, seemed to have bloated limbs. Water sloshed from side to side on the boards, which were the planks of a deck. He almost let himself fall in despair. Then he began to drag himself frantically up the stairs, which perhaps were swaying after all. Through the windows, he thought he saw the cityscape rising and falling. There seemed to be no refuge upstairs, for the stagnant stench was everywhere. But refuge wasn't what he was seeking. He reeled across the office, which he darkened when leaving, into his cubicle. Perhaps papers were falling from desks only because he had staggered against them. His key felt ready to snap in half before the drawer opened. He snatched out the bottle, in which something rattled insect-like, and stumbled to the window. Yes, he had been meant to find the bottle. But by whom, or by what? Wrenching open the lock of the window, he flung the bottle into the night. He heard it smash a moment later. Whatever was inside, it must have certainly smashed too. At once, everything felt stable, so abruptly that he grew dizzier. He felt as though he'd just stepped onto land after a stormy passage. There was silence except for the murmur of the city, which sounded quite normal, or perhaps there was another sound, faint and receding fast. It might have been a gust of wind, but he thought it resembled a chorus of cries of relief, so profound it was appalling. Was one of them his uncle's voice? Barry slumped against the window, which felt like ice against his forehead. There was no reason to flee now, nor did he think he would be capable of moving for some time. Perhaps they would find him here in the morning. It hardly mattered. If he could get some sleep. All at once he tried to hold himself absolutely still in order to listen. Surely he needn't be nervous any longer. Just because the ship in the bottle had been deserted, surely that didn't mean but his legs were trembling and infected the rest of his body until he couldn't even strain his ears. By then, however, he could hear far better than he would have liked. Perhaps he had destroyed the ship and set free its captives, but if it had had a captain, what else might Barry have set loose? The smell had grown worse than stagnant, and up the stairs, and now, across the dark office, irregular but purposeful footsteps were sloshing.
Early next morning, several people reported glimpses of a light supposedly moving out from the Thames into the open sea. Some claimed the light had been accompanied by sounds like singing. One old man tried to insist that the light had contained the outline of a ship. The reports seemed little different from tales of objects in the sky and were quickly dismissed, for London had a more spectacular mystery to solve. How a publisher's editor could be found in a first-floor office, not merely dead, but drowned.